what they said. The panelists. Good evening, I'm Eric Firestone. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on a Monday evening. It's an incredible turnout on Monday. Uh, we're here to celebrate Martha Edelheit and this incredible show that we put together, uh, Tales from the 60s. Um, I want to thank the panelists for coming this evening. Uh, and, um, you know, this just speaks of a continuum of what the mission is of the gallery, which is to really uh, re examine work that needs to be. Uh, uh, put into the historical canon and uh, level the playing field a little bit. And so uh, our commitment to doing that in New York is uh, true. And uh, thank you for being here. And now I'm going to introduce you to Jennifer Salmon, Director of Research for the Gallery. So thank you. First of all, I want to thank um, Marty, as we know her, um, Marty Edelheit, um, who couldn't be here tonight because she lives in Sweden. Um, but thank you to Marty for um, letting us show these amazing paintings that she made in the 1960s. And um, thank you to our amazing panelists who are here today. Um, so we've assembled a panel of artists to talk um, about their own work and to also talk about Marty's work and how it resonates with them. And um, so I have here um, Joyce Kozloff. And Joyce is an artist who lives in New York and is represented by DC Moore Gallery. Uh, she has completed 16 public art projects in the US and abroad. And the most recent just opened, I'm very excited about this because it's a local subway station for me, um, at the 86th Street and Central Park West subway station, the BNC Lines, commissioned by the MTA Arts and Design Program, just opened two weeks ago, so that's very exciting. Um, and she has been active in the women's movement since 1970 and worked on the fourth issue of Heresies Magazine with Martha Edelheit and others. Kippa Chavez was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and lives in Brooklyn, New York. Chavez trained in miniature painting at the National College of Arts and received an MFA in painting from Pratt Institute. Her solo shows include The Garden um, at New Image Art in Los Angeles um, this year, 2018, um, and Self Portraits Project for an Empty Space, 2017, Paint with Roses, Thierry Goldberg Gallery, 2015. Um, Jeff Chadsey is represented by Jack Shaneman Gallery, where he had a solo show, a great show, just um, this past May, right? Um, called That's Not It. He has received fellowships from NIFA, the Fine Art Work Center, the Gerbode Foundation, and the Fleisch Hacker Foundation. He is also a full-time photo editor at Time, Inc. And moderating our panel tonight is Nancy Prinsenthal. Nancy is a Brooklyn-based writer, and her books include Agnes Martin, Her Life and Art, which won the 2015 Penn Literary Award in biography, and the monograph Hannah Wilkie. She is a contributing editor of Art in America and teaches at the School of Visual Arts in New York. And she is working on a book to be published next fall that's called Unspeakable Acts, which is about how acts of sexual violence are represented in the art world of the 1970s. So that's something to look forward to next year. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Eric. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting evening, and I feel privileged to be part of it. Um, when I um, got the call to um, moderate this panel, I thought it's time for me to fill in some information about Martha Edelheit, who I didn't know that well. And um, Joyce encouraged me to um, go to the source, which I'm very 
glad you did. So I'm just going to say a few words uh, about my conversation with Marty Edelheid, and then I'm going to turn um, the floor over to the panelists, each of whom will give a presentation about their own work, and then we'll have a conversation among ourselves, and then we'll open it up to you guys at the end. Um, so um, when I contacted Marty Edelheid first by email, I said, so, you know, she said, tell me what you want to talk about. And I said, well, you know, um, tell me about issues of exposure and affirmation. How did you see these flesh walls? Were they celebratory? Um, were they about addressing um, imbalances of power in the art world? What were the gender politics? And she, when I got her on the phone, she left and she said, you know, we did not use that language in 1963. <laughs> that had nothing to do with it. And you know what she referred to. This was so interesting to me. Was she said, "Here are the landmarks of my life in terms of coming to terms with what we now call sexual politics: the Kinsey report, um, the Kinsey report on male sexual behavior was published in 1948. The report on female sexual sexual behavior came later. Um, that was a year before she graduated high school. So that was a big event. She talked about the advent of Playboy." And Marty Edelheid being a venturesome artist, and she still is hugely active and alert and has seen more art than um, me or you or um, most people. Um, it, she comes here a couple of times a year and, and really hits the ground running, as Joy says. Um, so, uh, you know, sure enough, she went and saw one of the first Playboy clubs in, uh, not long after it opened. Um, she said that, you know, at the moment when she was first undertaking a career as an artist, those were um, among the sort of landmarks in, in talking about these issues, Freud was still king. Um, so there was a lot of talking about sex. Sex was a problem. No one knew what women wanted, and neither did they make a huge big effort to find out. <laughs> um, so um, she said that the flesh worlds were not formulated in the context of feminism, although she'd read about two thirds of um, Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. Um, she terminated that reading because she felt it was jeopardizing her marriage to a very supportive guy who <laughs> um, was um, behind her work in every other respect. Um, they went on a tour of Europe, and um, and she, she was she went to the University of, University of Chicago. She was kind of self-taught as an artist, um, but seeing um, work by Fregonard, by Boucher, Tiepolo, Rubens, all of that was a huge part of her education for this body of work. Although she started as an abstract artist. Um, she entered the art world, and so I'm describing a kind of various background. She entered the art world um, through having met the director of what became the Rubin Gallery, and the first artists with whom she was connected were the artists who introduced happenings. So she knew Ellen Capro and Jim Dine and Klaus Oldenburg. She participated in happenings, and um, that also became part of a spirit of openness that I think is very clear in this um, body of work. These paintings um, were first shown at the Byron Gallery, an exhibition in 1966, um, where she said the entire, um, and I, I take this at her word because she seems incredibly honest, the entire art world showed up. So Leo Castelli was there, and Billy Kluver of Experiments in Art and Technology was there. She said he blushed. John Kennedy, <laughs> who was then the very powerful sort of Roberta Smith of his day, he was the regular art critic from the New York Times, spent two and a half hours in the gallery, but declined to review the show. And I, I think actually that experience is sort of a lot of attention and yet very little critical response. And I'm, I'm guessing not, not that much in the way of sales either, um, was, uh, you know, was, was sort of a moment of discouragement. And I'm, I'm not talking right now that much about the works on paper, all that, the, those amazing works were also going on at the same time with slightly different sources of interest. Um, and it, indeed, it, at, you know, at the moment where second wave feminism emerged in the early 1970s, 
she jumped in right away, and one of the people she was lucky enough to meet at that time um, was um, Joyce Kozloff. So I, I who, um, it, just one other thing that I found really interesting, um, because I'm in the middle of that endless book of social history, otherwise known as gossip, about um, the painters of the New York, the women painters of the New York School. Um, I was really interested to learn that one of the very early um, women's movement meetings that Marty Adelheit went to was at Elaine de Kooning's house. Mm -hmm. So I think we're not often enough alert to how generations overlap, which is mm -hmm. part of what we're celebrating here. So um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Joyce, um, and I guess you'll maybe um, you, yeah, uh, Nancy asked me to submit 10 images of my work, and um, I just, I didn't know, you know, 10 images. So, I'm not, my work has nothing to do with Marty's, really. <laughs> I mean, we couldn't be more different, but she is a dear friend, and I've known her a long time, so I think I should just flip through this pretty fast. So this is the new piece in the subway, one of six sections. So this is what I'm excited about now. That's the detail I did. Oops. Oops. Is that is that it? I thought I had submitted yeah, ten. It's more. okay. Yeah, there were earlier. Oh. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So this is a this is um, an installation in 1979 um, of called an interior decorated, which was. A, you know, a very negative pejorative thing in the art world. And a group of us, including Cynthia Carlson, were embracing the decorative. And this is done with, it's all individual ceramic tiles that I made with cookie cutters. And uh, silk screen silks that were done at the fabric workshop. So that's a detail of the floor. Every tile was painted. And then I went into public art, and this, this piece is in the Harvard Square subway station, 1985. And it's called New England Decorative Arts, and it's in different sections that show different, you know, it's, this, that was looking down the ramp, no, that was looking up the ramp, and this is, this, it's a pedestrian ramp, and this is looking up the ramp. And then this is a piece called Targets that I did in 99-2000, and it's a, uh, you probably don't think any of these things have anything to do with each other, but I'm skipping around. Uh, it's a three meter globe that you enter, and the, you can pull the door closed in the last section, so you're completely surrounded. And those are aerial maps of all the places that the U.S. bombed between 1945 and 2000 and it's called Targets. And that's being inside a bit. And that, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I can't help being struck by the a relationship between your use of the, of the decorative and there is a degree of involvement that we had with the decorative both in the wallpaper works that she was doing and and to the extent that these I was looking at that section yeah. over there. It, were the those issues the, that you the Matisse quote. Yeah. 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 Did you talk about that at the time? Well we Melissa Meyer and uh, Marty and I were on the collective of the fourth issue of a, a women's magazine called Heresies mm -hmm. and it was called Women's Traditional Arts, the Politics of Aesthetics. And so we spent a year looking at the decorative arts of many different cultures and talking about the politics of that and why it was, you know, why there was a hierarchy in Western art and it wasn't taken seriously. And Marty was very involved in that, very engaged with that. As a researcher as well as, as yeah. a painter. Yeah. 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 You know, at the opening I said to her, I asked her um, why she hadn't painted that one when she left it as a drawing. Mm -hmm. And um, she said it was always meant to be a drawing. And I said, well, why don't you paint it again now as a painting? I mentioned this to Eric earlier. 
And she looked at me, you know, and, um, but then recently she said to me, you know, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> at the same scale? Yeah, I think it should be the same scale. So I mean, she, she's interested in all kinds of things, you know. Uh, when she comes to New York, we often go to galleries and museums together, which is a couple times a year. She's, she hits the ground running, as you said, in the morning, and w I told a couple people, we saw the Sarah Lucas show together, and she didn't really know the work, and she just loved it. She was running around taking pictures of everything. Yeah. And, yeah. Challenging work? Yeah. So I'm Jeff. I'm the I'm the male news part of the uh, the evening. I don't know. Like I don't know how well people can see these things. Um, so I uh, I'm new to Marty's work, um, and I've been I can't say immersing myself, but reading a lot about it. Um, this weekend in preparation for this evening and kind of musing on the how almost quaint it was that people were so upset about her nudes back in the 60s and in particular the male nudes just something about like the affront of the the, the undecorated male penis in a, in a in a room that just made a lot of people clutch their pearls and their <laughs> ascots, but um, I mean, it's even interesting, like, the, I mean, I, I did the same thing with this piece, I just was, I stupidly was looking at it, I loved it, but I was like, is this unfinished? Um, and it's interesting that even, you know, the, this wall of male nudes, that there's something so kind of phantom-like about it, kind of comparing the two, that you kind of look at a field of women in a landscape, and you look at it and you're like, it's a field of women in the landscape. And then you look at this one and you're like, oh my god, it's a gay orgy. <laughs> so, anyways, I uh, do large drawings of nudish, male-ish figures that I kind of compile from uh, a lot of images that I collect on the internet. And of course the internet, one of the main engines of its existence is this kind of propagation of um, JPEGs, a lot of them nude. So uh, kind of what I'm doing is kind of playing with this male presentation of kind of these figures that are kind of presenting themselves to this unnamed viewer, you, uh, and kind of playing with these kind of tropes of masculinity. So they're either like, and kind of at, we'll, we'll, we'll speak to that right now. So anyways, this is a figure that has changed gender probably three times over the two years that I was playing with it and then eventually kind of grew these ape-like arms and I've showed it like with a vagina, showed it with a penis and finally last year at Jack Shingman I was like, oh my god, it just needs a fanny pack. So, <laughs> you know, fanny pack with a gun. It's called Chimpy and it's about uh, seven and a half feet tall, I think. Uh, you know, this is something I'm like completely fascinated with clothing and kind of how clothing is performative um, and how clothing can uh, perform a certain masculinity, kind of em uh, embellish it and also kind of be its failure. So there was something about like years ago, I was just like in my studio and I was like, what is the most absurd clothing that I can think of, and I was like, it's the pussy bow blouse. So I was like obsessively like Googling pussy bow blouses. Anyways, I did a series of these drawings that just happened like Gucci, five weeks later came out with their own line of, of pussy bow blouses, and anyways, I still read it. Um, and again, it's just like this kind of combining this, this kind of internalized ambivalence of being kind of celebratory and fey and effeminate and at the same time this kind of like internalized chokehold, which also is a fabulous fashion accessory. <laughs> I'm also really, I said I was going to talk for five minutes, I could probably talk for 45 minutes, but anyways, I'm also really fascinated with like the other thing, that, the other engine of the internet is um, photos that uh, 
people posted themselves drunk. And so there's like this whole collection I have of passed out frat boys that have been drawn on by their, their frat brothers. <laughs> this is Keith Richards <laughs> with no pants on and no penis. And I'm also completely, um, the other like abject fashion choice that I'm just completely cannot get enough of is socks and sandals. I just, <laughs> I was at a, at a, at a opening and um, the artist Karen Moore came up to me and she grabbed me and she was like, oh, socks and sandals. She's like, I'm so excited you're doing that. And Karen Moore was like, don't you dare. <laughs> Um, a lot of my work kind of plays with gender presentations. Um, this is the kind of traditional, like you know, nude reclining on the on the on the couch. Uh, but then I and it's, again, it was just a photo I found online that I've been probably carrying with me for for years on my computer. And then I just kind of combined it with Manet's Olympia. And you know, so much of what I feel like I'm doing recently in the drawings is kind of denying the existence of the penis. So it's just like I mean. It's, Amazing. It's amazing how it takes over a room when you have a a show, and so I felt like a lot of it was a lot of the drawings I started doing was about somehow like hiding that from view. And you know, this morning I just was you know I was kind of looking up more and more about Marty's art, and kind of was shocked at this comparison. I mean, it's not alarming to find a comparison of two artists that are riffing off of Michelangelo's David, but still, it's you know that she's kind of queering the canon of t turning uh, Michelangelo's David into this heroic Amazon. And <clears throat> I did the same thing. I just took a chisel to the sculpture, <laughs> lopped that little dick off, and added breasts, and <laughs> ran with this. Uh, I had gone to Rome last year to turn 50, and there were these coming, uh, there's all over these Diana of Aphrasis, um, that's how you say it, sculptures. A fertility symbol, these women that are kind of multiple breasts, um, there's some debate over whether that figure was uh, kind of conjured up from a mistranslation. There's some people that feel like, that think that she's actually not, ha she doesn't have breasts, that she has bull testicles. <laughs> Staple to her front. <laughs> but wearing a lovely blazer. <laughs> <laughs> this is. <laughs> Literally strip nude, no skin. Uh, this, um, I, yet another example. I, I don't know if you guys can see any of this, but I basically replaced the the penis with a braid, and he's wearing the Kushner, that absurd Kushner bulletproof vest that was in the news like two years ago. <laughs> Nothing to say about that, but it's lovely. <laughs> These, this is probably one of the last drawings I did that was at Jack Shaman this, this summer. And again, kind of almost playing with the nude, but now completely dressing it up. So there's just kind of these like hints of nudity. Again, the hints of the penis with a hand gra grabbing in. Someone jokingly called that pussy grabbing with the cat in the bag. <laughs> Goodness, there's just more and more. Another fanny pack. I spent hours Googling trying to find the perfect fanny pack and I ended up just ordering this from Amazon. <laughs> I spent an hour in my studio trying out various fanny packs and jamming my hands in them. God, they just keep coming. Um, so I don't really have a planned presentation about my work, so I'm just going to show you uh, some images and talk a little about what I do. Um, like uh, Martha, I, I also work primarily, or well, I don't know if she still just works primarily with the body, but I work um, with the body. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, I'm originally from... Um, 
Karachi, Pakistan, and I um, my background is in Indo-Persian miniature painting, which is what I worked in for about a, a decade or so. I moved here uh, six, seven years ago um, when I was turning 30s. It was like ooh, midlife crisis. <laughs> yeah. So I've been um, I've been drawing uh, myself since I was a girl, um, mostly in my bedroom, in front of a mirror, secretly. And um, when I started working professionally as an artist, I continued with drawing the body, but um, I sort of, while I was working in Pakistan, I removed uh, the face almost entirely. And so when I moved here, I brought the face back into the paintings. Um, and it kind of started with a lot of these miniature works where you have this profile of the face. Um, because in like in Islamic art, uh, you don't really paint realistic portraits. You go for like a stylization of the body so you're not completely <coughs> thought. Um, so a lot of the miniatures and even the larger works are um, in profile and they're heavily uh, stylized. And uh, then when I got here, I started trying to teach myself about um, you know uh, Western art history, and uh, I started studying all the old master paintings and um, <coughs> trying to replicate myself as uh, the women in them. And she was one of the first uh, first paintings I did was uh, the odalisk and I still remember I sprained my neck trying to sit like her. <laughs> <laughs> so I just became really obsessed with um, women being painted over history and how I'd always thought they were being painted realistically, but they were just being painted as some like I ideal version of what a woman should look like. Um, and so again, I was like just riffing off uh, a lot of um, art historical uh, portraits, but so yeah, that's that's my work. I I mostly um, this one is called uh, Dreamers. It's this is like kind of almost this sort of scale, but it's all my work is painted on paper. Um, I use a lot of tea and watercolor and whatever I can find, um, which can be mixed with water. And um, I guess mostly I, I mean, I only paint women. Um, and I guess I just try to like portray the natural expression, like a natural female expression, um, as, as I experience being a woman, or like create like a safe space um, for women to be like there's no there's no like deep reason for it like there's no agenda it's just kind of I paint women and I want them to be happy and safe. Um, this is a uh, this is a a shot of my studio or earlier on this year just to kind of I thought I'd throw it in there just to give you a sense of scale and um, this last slide is. Um, sort of where my work has been moving, uh, with the figures kind of coming out of the painting onto the wall and creating more of a, a fantasy world. Like I felt with uh, a lot of my earlier work, it was a little more psychological. And post-election, I kind of wanted some levity. <laughs> so I started painting a lot of flowers. Um, that, that's it. I'm going to ask all three of you is the same question I put to, to Marty on the phone, which is uh, how, how do you, you know, how do you think this language has changed over the last, this is more than 50 years, and, and how do you see your work in relationship to the work that's on the walls? Well, I mean, I was reading the, the literature that came with the press packet. I was struck by, like, there's an essay by Alan Capro talking about women 
dealing with sexuality in their artwork. <coughs> and he's uh, kind of describing it in relation to sexuality as it's typically portrayed by heterosexual men, which he says is always somehow couched in allegory and mythology. Men's gaze, and it, assuming this is specifically referring to Marty's paintings, since he knew her, as, pit, as pitiless and, and amoral because that there was no judgment involved in it, and that it was literal because it was just directly seeing. And he kind of contrasted that with <coughs> homosexual art dealing with sexuality, and that, that typically used camp strategies. So in some ways, I'm kind of like struck by that essay. I still haven't quite managed to peel that one apart, but that you know, also that this was a culture where, I mean, Joyce, maybe you could talk about it. It's just that, you know, it seems like. Well, I, I printed out that article. I, I was interested in it also. Yeah, I mean, there, there was another article too where she, like, Marty talked about going to see George O'Keefe and she kind of repeats a, a review that Greenberg had written of uh, George O'Keefe's show at, at um, MoMA. I, I I just sent this text to Angela because I was just so curious over the phrasing, so I'm, just, I'm never going to remember it, so I'm just going to read it. But um, if my phone loads, um, bear with me for one second. Anyways, he kind of talks about, uh, yes, he says, in this kind of, talk about scathingly moral, he talks about her paintings having less to do with art than with private worship and the embellishment of private fetishes with secret and arbitrary meanings, which I think <laughs> so beautifully <laughs> illustrates all of our work. I mean, it seems like kind of he inadvertently created this door for all of us to kind of walk into a kind of create art that very specifically deals with that. So, I don't know, I'm just curious, like I'm curious about like people that have somehow had a closer relationship with that culture back then that was seemed much more monoculture in some ways. I was going to read this chap this paragraph from the Alan Capra piece. Oh, because not only is it of all the, the we were sent writings about Marty uh, from that time, and, and not that many. Um, and not only was it the most interesting one, but the other ones were quoting it. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think this is the paragraph you're referring to. Female art in general plays no games as men's art does, including homosexual men's art. No one wins. There are no victims or protagonists. It is thoughtful but not intellectual, insofar as intellectuality is a game. It is not editorial either, insofar as discriminations between degrees of moral good or bad are also a game. Female fantasy is pervasive, boundless, unconcerned with definition and measure. When sex is its primary involvement, the involvement is total and therefore shameless. It is for this reason terrifying to men, not because it suggests to the latter that the loss of their, to the latter the loss of their status, but because it implies the loss of the game, which is their life. Yeah. So I mean that's a. I don't know that someone would write that today. <laughs> <laughs> And it was 66. written in, in 66 on the occasion of the show, and it was meant, it's funny, so three of us, maybe um, you've done the same thing, have actually got this thing in their hands because it's so perplexing. Mm -hmm. I actually um, came with a, with a paragraph from this review, too. Um, <laughs> partly because I couldn't understand it. Really. <laughs> He's tripping all over himself. Kind of. Yeah, so, and this is interesting because we seem to have had three different perspectives on what he was saying. I was so struck by um, this idea that um, heterosexual men, of course, are conventional. They define the convention. Um, but gay men and women, who are sort of a single category in the beginning of the review, <laughs> are direct and concrete in their treatment of sex. So heterosexual men are playing this game um, that the rest of us don't want any part of. Well, the interesting part is that, like, the heterosexual men are playing, the gay men and the women are like somehow being pitiless and like yes, there's something, there's no exactly. like pleasure somehow being acknowledged in. Exactly. Yeah. The, and the, you know, and we're ruining their game and so we're, you know, all together it's a kind of 
it's an, it's an unhappy resolution. Um, <laughs> really perplexing. You know, which is, I mean, even if we can't completely unpack it, it's a fascinating sort of um, soul surviving response to the show. Mm -hmm. And it, I think, reveals, if nothing else, the confusion um, that greeted awesome. this work, even from someone as presumably open-minded as um, Alan Capro. So um, I think it was supposed to be a review of a Marty Edelheit show. Yes, it was. But he doesn't mention her until the last sentence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to read that? Yeah. Well, it's, I have not specifically spoken of the work of my, it's, it's, it's a long piece. <laughs> I have not specifically spoken of the work of Martha Edelheit, but instead have tried to see the issues raised by it. It is because I take for granted that any art which is capable of raising issues of human importance is important art. Martha, Martha Edelheit joins Lee Bontecu, Jean Follet, Marisol and Yayoi Kusama, among others, in bringing to our attention something that has been lost to us for 2,000 years. <laughs> we wonder what that is. That's a long drive. Yeah. <laughs> but he finally got around to mentioning the subject yes, of the. So that wasn't, that wasn't exactly where I expected this question to go, but it does tell you something about, uh, you know, how the meaning of the work has sort of um, shifted. And, and I think your relationship to it, Jeff, as, as you were able to show it, that was wonderful, that comparison of two images of Michelangelo is, is pretty direct. Um, and, you know, your exhibit is direct too in something that I was struck by both of you sharing, which is this decision, which is also true of Martin's work, of working at life size. So how did you come to that commitment and how do you feel it connects to what Marty is doing, <laughs> if at all? Um. Well, I, I started working life-size just maybe a few years ago, and um, the power of the figure, when the figure is life-size or larger than you, is it's different, it's much more connecting, it's much more direct, it's much more, like, I guess, confrontational for the person looking at it, although I don't know if that's... Like, my, for me, when I was making, when I make the paintings I make, they weren't meant to be uh, confrontational. They were just, it was like a, another person that I was connecting to, except it wasn't a real person. Um, but when I saw everyone's reaction to it, I realized how having a figure which is a human scale, we react to it like a person mm -hmm. as opposed to like a small representation of a person even if the figure is not like Marty's work is completely it's much more realistic than mine I mean sh the way she's mastered the body is kind of amazing and she's obviously very um, preoccupied with the model and the body and mm -hmm. the figure mm -hmm. um, so I think for her it would also be I, I don't, I've never spoken to her, I can't speak for her. Um, I'm guessing that that interaction of having a human scale body is important as a form of connection that she has with the people that she's painting. There's something real about it, right? Yeah, you kind of, you have, you have to fall into it. It's yeah. Like, yeah. And it just consumes you. And then you don't have a choice, really. She painted the same people over and over again in the in, within the same painting, mm -hmm. and from one painting to the next, she had a couple models that she liked, and, and she wasn't looking friends. for people with idealized bodies yeah. either. Well, there was another review I read in that packet, which I thought was curious too, which is that you know you read about people being shocked about the nudes, and yet there's one. But there, there's a Rosalind Krauss talking about seeing her work in, I think, an explicitly erotic art gallery, and so kind of seeing it in that context, which I think she kind of fought against in some ways, yeah. it was too confining. Um, but then another review kind of talking about her nudes being this kind of Arcadian, you know, 
it's like these innocent nude figures in this landscape that somehow again removed all the sexuality out of it. So it's just interesting to see how people kind of <coughs> process the images. For sure, and and how we process them now. So uh, you know, I mean, this goes back, I suppose, to the question of. Do they seem um, celebratory? Do they seem slightly sinister? Do they seem decorative? You know, those are, I guess, the three poles. Um, which is a question. For me, as a, as a woman who paints women's bodies, um, when I see uh, that painting, um, which is an amazing painting, um, it's like a painting made by a painter and that that is that comes out first that this is a painter who's working with the body she loves the body she's painting it um and of course it's so like every person in it has a, a character like there's a woman with pink hair and purple hair and green hair there's a there's a dog in there which i notice later <laughs> and the way uh, there's all this movement in the background, which is changing um, tones from per, per canvas, it's just kind of like it's like a body, but it's also like a metamorphosis. But it's also people. I've totally forgotten the question while I've been talking. About <laughs> <laughs> so I don't see it as sinister. Yeah. I mean, I feel like her smaller works are more deeply psychological, mm -hmm. and in the larger works, she's addressing more painterly concerns. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, I think she relates to them as people in a way, but also as a painter would try to make that perfect composition. Like, you see that in it. She was involved with psychoanalysis. She was in psychoanalysis. She was married to a psychoanalyst. And I think you do see that in the drawings very much. In, in what in respect? In the drawings. In the drawings, yeah. Yeah, more, I agree with you. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. It's more in the drawings than in the paintings. It's like, like a drawing, was, like a drawing inherently you can indulge in a fantasy more. It's like related to the doodle right. as opposed to the painting. Just it's like, like a, a, it's like a like stream of consciousness or something. <coughs> Whereas the painting is the models in the studio, you know. So were they contemporaneous, the drawings on the yeah. painting? Or? They were, yeah. Do you want to say more about the, the drawings, Joyce? No, I wonder who would other people think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm curious how she talked about it in relation to her paintings. Did they, did, were they, did she kind of consider them equals, or were those kind of preparatory works, or? Eric told me she recently did some very similar ones. So it's maybe been something she's always done, rather privately, mm -hmm. um, which surprised me. But the other thing about the drawings, they're full of acrobats and gymnastics, and she always did that. Because um, I remember at the Harris's meeting, she was always coming from the gym where she was doing acrobatics. Seriously, I mean, she's very wiry and uh, to this day. So it was that those drawings come out of her uh, a lot of knowledge of the body and what the body can do. She also mentioned to me in this. Um, one conversation that one um, one source for some of the imagery in the drawings was that she was spending a lot of time in um, a, a VA hospital or several VA hospitals helping care for her brother who was involved in some horrific um, motorcycle accident um, and that that experience really affected her very deeply and also shaped uh, if, you, if you've been able to spend any time with the drawings, you know that it, they're um, both very um, full of life and energy and, and this you know, very kind of lively um, circus acrobatic um, imagery. And they're also full of really, really dark imagery being death. Um, and I think um, that as with so many um, artists, uh, drawings offer an opportunity, right, to explore things that um, are um, private, it, you know, that, that you don't necessarily want to commit to with this scale and this degree of, you know, sort of public life, which is something that I think, you know, all of you in, in 
affect work at life size, right? Um, sort of you're there face to face with. Um, with, with the public and the private. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to list a, a, a couple of artists that she referred to. Um, so Jeff has already mentioned her article on George O'Keefe, who is obviously important to her. She wrote an article about Marie Lasnig, um, in which she also mentioned Louise Bourgeois, Joan Semmel, Alice Neal, Ida Applebrook. Um, Joyce, you've mentioned that when she came to New York, she saw Sarah Lucas's show and liked it. She mentioned to me Rona Pondick. Um, these are some of the artists who um, I think can be considered sort of part of her family. Um, are there others that you think are part of her family or that link her to your own work? Uh, I would definitely say Carolee Schneeman. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Sorry? Carolee Schneeman. I mean, I know they participated in performances yeah. together. Lucas Samaras. And Lucas Samaras, sure. who was a very close friend of hers. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any questions? Sure. This is a good time to, uh, to do this. My friend Jamil here brought me here. I didn't know why I was coming to. And I'm sorry I didn't bring my issue number four. Of Harris oh. is with me. Now that Joyce Kosloff is here. Um, but I have two questions. Uh, one, first of all, who was Jean Follet? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. I should have looked it up. Okay, so we have to find out what happened to Jean Follet. <laughs> well, we can't well mention. Right. And that list along with Gary yes. Akusama, et cetera. But, um, yeah, is there anything you can, can you tell us uh, more about issue number four? And I, I'm going to go home and look at it. What should I look What about for? you, Melissa? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, it's actually not pronounced Follett, it's pronounced Follett. Follett. <laughs> Jean Follett, maybe it's not, maybe I gave it a French pronunciation. <laughs> um, yeah. So Melissa Meyer worked on the issue, and, and I thought maybe she'd have something to say about it. But can you tell us more about what's going on? And okay, well, you decorative, know. Especially in terms of decorative arts versus fine arts. Okay. And that whole question. We, our mission was to to look at the decorative arts globally, and we had an anthropologist on the collective who was reaching out for articles from other anthropologists and art historians, as well as artists who were trying to do decorative work ourselves, and, and look at these traditions, which in many cases, but not always, were female traditions. And so we wanted to celebrate it. But one of the things that we discovered in doing our research was that in many cultures, um, it was, you know, in, in, I don't know, 16th century Europe, little girls went blind making lace. And they only had little girls making the lace because they, they had the eyes until they lost them. And in, in other cultures and other parts of the world, they have little girls uh, weaving and that in fact this was not necessarily always something that was a celebratory thing. And um, it, so we had a, it started out women's decorative arts and then a slash the politics of aesthetics. And in, in some cultures, what women did that we might have celebrated, which would be usually a pottery and weaving, <coughs> that wasn't considered art at all. And stone carving was considered art, and in some of these cultures, women weren't even allowed to see the stone carving. So it became, the, the whole process became very complicated and layered, and I think that that issue is very rich in that way. I'm sorry, I wanted no, Melissa no, no, to no, talk, it's but... Fine. No, it's perfect. I didn't, um, I didn't realize that was going to come up tonight. <laughs> didn't about, I didn't prepare. <laughs> but I'm um, thinking about how we were at your law and we sat around in a circle and everybody talked about what they were interested in and I thought, oh, okay, I have to say something. And <laughs> then I said, I'm wondering why so many women made collages. And then Mimi came up to me, Miriam Shapiro came up to me and said, I want to work with you on that. 
And, and I thought, oh no. <laughs> anyway, and um, so then we did a lot of research on that and um, became um, Femage, and, um, which was named by Grace Gluck, actually. So, um, she was part of the collective? No, but me he was talking to her on the phone and telling her what she was working on. And the idea that she said, oh, you need Femage? <laughs> I just have this little story that I wanted to tell about this, this, this thing with Marty being in these news. I asked her, I said, was your son, did you was your son around your studio when you were making these works with all these nudes, particularly the disembodied things? She says, oh yes, he saw everything that I was doing. And when he went to school when he was very young, this was an elementary school, and the kids were drawing, he was drawing nudes. <laughs> <laughs> and reprimanded for it heavily. But the teacher sent to the principal the whole thing, they called the parents up, and then she marched to the school and read School of Riot Act. She <laughs> said, I'm an artist, I do this stuff, my kids been exposed to stuff in the studio, I'm part of art history, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so, But I was like really surprised that, you know, she felt no, which is wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seven, Joey. He remembers that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I was going to say, today, I, she forwards a lot of things. I, I, I'm sure other people in the audience who are friends of hers get them too. We're on, we're on the list. So today, I got an article about Verrocchio's David. Oh, and yeah. Did you get that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally gay figure. But uh, this was actually a very good piece. It was a very good piece, I thought. I haven't read it I think it was on Artsy or something. So she, you know, she's in a, living in an hour outside of Sweden in the country, but she's online all the time. <laughs> so she knows everything that's going on. I have a question. Uh, what, what do you feel is the role of the artist versus propagandist? Or maybe not versus, but just those two words. Just I'm hearing words there. like feminism and just various roles. <coughs> and Maybe Nancy should answer that. Can you clarify what you mean by propaganda? That's sort of what I'm asking. Um, I was at this uh, at a talk last week at uh, Vice, and it was a talk about the uh, for Freedoms, the, this organization uh, which is uh, Hank Willis Thomas and a bunch of artists, Marilyn Minter, are all involved in it. And uh, Marilyn Minter was there and she was talking a little bit about how some of us artists are really bad at doing political stuff and some of us are really good. And in her conversation, she I distinctly remember her saying this, that um, when artists band together, sometimes they can be uh, like the best pro like propaganda artists and how she feels like she is a propaganda artist in that way. So I think it's different for every artist, like you don't have to have a, an agenda or a propaganda. I mean in some way in this day and age I think we're all kind of political animals, uh, whether it's, you know, gender, geography, politics, um, but not all of us engage with it actively in the studio or so directly, as in Joyce was part of the, the women's movement and she works with uh, decorative art, uh, which is, you could say, well, that's also a stand you take in the time when people are doing abstraction and you're like, well, I'm going to do this. And, um, but at the same time, she's not necessarily a propaganda artist, even though she has taken a stand for herself. Am I making any sense? Yes. Yeah? No, he says no. Yeah. <laughs> no. That was a beautiful response. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so. Um, I was wondering when I was looking at the, some of the works, what her, and I talked to Nancy a little bit about this, what her relationship to tattooing is, 
And that seemed like such an unusual subject for women of that time period. And I noticed that there was a lot of references, like in that bottom pass and also in that other thing over there, um, to the symbols of tattooing. And did she have tattoos? I don't think she had tattoos. Joyce, or maybe no? most of you. Yeah, no. But she was very interested. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, were you saying if it's if it's not propaganda, it is a uh, um, objective? Did I? No. There are many other. There's a lot of the nomenclature to describe different kinds of art and venues. It's decorative. I like that. Me too. <laughs> I just avoided the question altogether. <laughs> There's a question all the way to the back. I have a question not only for the people on the panel, but some of her friends that were here when she was young and started up. I'm, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the, the milieu that you, the historical milieu that she was in, because I think she's a, sort of arrived at a very interesting part of New York history where abstract expressionism was kind of running out of gas. You had a whole lot of various things, the women's movement, pop art, minimalism, and stuff. all this stuff was kind of cooking up around here. I was wondering if anybody would like to kind of maybe fill in some aspects of that and, and how they sort of saw the influences uh, affecting her and her work. You know, there was the uh, return of the figure artists, people like Alex Caskill, Pearlstein, Jane Street Gallery people, Anybody have anything that would like to kind of I just wanted to say something about that about the tattoos. <laughs> that <laughs> so sorry. Well we so, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, that was definitely something that she was looking at, I think. And the the press release says that she had read Claude Levi Strauss and how his writing about tattoos as being a kind of original uh, form of body ornament. And um, yeah, so the answer to the question, whoever asked, was that that played a role, I think, in the drawings as well as in the paintings. Mm -hmm. It's in the paintings. <laughs> okay. No. Nope. Actually, there was also the piece for the sister chapel with all the tattoos on the David. Mm -hmm. And that was very, very deliberate. And that was about the subject matter, too. It wasn't just the decorative aspect. You're talking about that drawing for yeah, the I mean, it seems like Why don't you tell them what Sister Chapel was? Oh, um, Sister Chapel still exists, actually. It was a collaborative uh, piece done by 13 women in which, in which each woman did one painting of a female hero or heroine, nine feet by five feet. And it's a permanent installation now in Pennsylvania. And Marty was in it, I was in it, Sylvia Sweet <laughs> was in it, um, Alice Neal was in it, um, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of other artists. Huh? It, um, Rowan University bought it, and it was first shown at PS1 in 1978 when they first opened. And I guess Marty had so many different female heroes that she couldn't put it in one painting, so she put it as decoration as tattoo <laughs> on, the, uh, on David. And I think, by the way, that's partly an answer to this question of the, um, the artistic milieu. milieu, you know, the. All, all the artists that were just named, as, you know, and the artists that she was associated with through the Rubin Gallery, that, you know, Lucas Morris, Jim Dine, Klaus Holdenberg, um, artists that um, she um, in, in met and, and associated with through the women's movement. All of, I mean, you know, if you take, take any given year, you know, the middle 60s, and there's so much going on, even in a much smaller art world than now, and not all of it is relevant. I mean, you know, minimalism was surging. I don't think that had much to do with what um, she was interested in, so it was popular, yeah. Why did, why did the term pluralism land in big time? And I remember an article by Hal Foster in which his negative description of pluralism was all couched in women's terms, like it was promiscuous. And there were like five or six other words that really referred to women who fuck too much. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and that was his big put down of pluralism. But that, was, that was a description of that time, and it was a very open and good one. 
There was just a lot going on. It was impossible to make a hierarchical kind of... Uh, yeah, that was the problem. And that was the problem, because that doesn't work for critics or sales or other... Globalism also. Right. Huh? There's a forerunner of globalism yeah. also. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah. She had seen the Kusama movie. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. Um, so I don't know. Because it's, um, her friendship with um, Samaras. Yeah. And um, Kusama claimed that Samaras had um, copied her, her um, glass, I think it was a glass house, or a mirrored room. Hmm. Well, also that place Old oh. ripped off her soft sculpture. And Wall 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 ripped off her wallpaper. <laughs> I'm sure Marty knew her. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Make it a good one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. I already asked a question, but just, I'm interested in this tattoo thing. Um, you know, because tattoos are a type of ornament, and I think we're also talking about, uh, I'm thinking about Adolf Loos, who uh, his article, Ornament is Crime, was illustrated with uh, <laughs> photographs of people of traditional cultures were tattoos. But again, there's this bias against ornament, decoration, and I think because it's associated. We dealt with that piece and that issue of heresies. <laughs> the out of those. You reproduced it in there? We, no. we dealt with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we argued with it. What year was that uh, issue of the 77? 70, 77, 78. We worked on it. Okay, and you know, I think of just a few years before that, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, in their uh, design journal, we published that essay with the original photograph. So it was certainly something that was in the air. Definitely. <laughs> Ornament is crime. <laughs> 1908. Or set nine or something. Fortunately, I, I think I can, I'm coming. It's very you. funny. If you read it now, it's really hilarious. Yeah, I don't think anybody <laughs> takes it too seriously anymore. <laughs> so that's a good answer to the question what's the difference between art and propaganda? If even ornament can be considered crime, just about anything can be considered propaganda, right? You know, depending upon your perspective. Anyway, thank you all very much.